All right, I'm here with Mr. Parag Morate, Chief Operating Officer of the San Francisco 49ers. Thanks for joining us, Parag. Of course. Now, I preface our little chat here by saying I am a 49ers fan. <laughs> I will do my best to be objective and not emotional in this interview. Those fumbles. Anyway, that's not, that's not the point. Parag, thanks for joining us. Now, I want to give a little no backstory. Uh, I'm from the Bay Area, so I, I've been following your career quite closely. I want to take you back to 2001 when you joined the front office of the 49ers. Okay. And you were one of the first ones to implement statistical analysis in, in general football, which wasn't done that much in the mm -hmm. NFL at that time, to the extent you were actually in the coaching booth at the time, which is just helping in various personnel decisions as well as uh, actual game time decisions. Now, as a, as, a, as a media fan, sports talk, when, and those are the years where times were a little tough for the Niner mm -hmm. land, they'd immediately point out, oh my God, why do we have an MBA? You are a Stanford <coughs> MBA. Why do we have an MBA uh, helping out in this process? Mm -hmm. I take you 11 years later and you're celebrating the theme of this conference is celebrating an, uh, analytics in sports. Mm -hmm. Walk us through the role of analytics in sports, specifically football. Sure, yeah, no, I think uh, the, the one thing that I should point out is that the fact that, or the idea that analytics didn't exist in the NFL is a, is a bit of a misnomer. Um, coaches and scouts have been using analytics for as long as the NFL has been around. Uh, for example, every week uh, at the beginning of a game week, uh, the quality control coaches or assistant coaches, they provide a pretty a uh, fairly pithy document, uh, w basically the game plan for that, uh, for that week's opponent, which is all around stats and analytics with respect to uh, how that team does against a run versus pass, how that team does against the blitz versus, uh, versus cover two and man coverage. I mean, all of those things, runs to the left versus runs to the right, um, those are, that's all analytics. Um, and that's something that has been in, uh, been in practice for a long period of time. I think... Uh, when I came in, I really started to identify three key areas where analytics can be used. Um, that's uh, to continue to augment what we already do on, on the field in, with respect to game management. Number two is uh, personnel evaluation, so really trying to identify physical traits or athletic characteristics that are good predictors of performance. And then number three is, uh, is the salary cap. Uh, you know, we've got a salary cap in the NFL. It's a hard salary cap. And so you really need to focus on how do you maximize return and minimize risk. It's really not dissimilar from what a portfolio manager of a hedge fund has to do. Uh, and that's, that's how you have to manage your salary cap because you, in order to be consistently good for a long period of time, you've got to make sure that you can manage the ebbs and flows of, uh, of player contracts. Interesting. And see, uh, and to the, to the credit of the ownership of the 49ers, the York family, they saw something, they saw value in that, and then they saw value in your <laughs> recognition of that. So I mean, that's a credit to the, to the ownerships. I, you know, I've been asking various general managers who I've interviewed today, as well as uh, we had Scott Boris on from an agent perspective. Mm -hmm. But let me ask you something from a, from a coach's perspective. Okay. You guys went out and made a fantastic hire, Coach of the Year, Jim Harbaugh, football mm -hmm. guy, comes from a football family. Yep. How do you tell him, hey, how receptive are they, these old school football guys, to analytics? So I'll say this. Uh, Football, uh, because we have 16 games, the importance of any individual game is so big that coaches always are looking for the, the best edge that they can get. Uh, Coach Harbaugh is about as competitive a person as I've ever met in my entire life. Um, but if I could provide him something that helps uh, give him an edge, uh, wherever it is, whether it's game management, whether it's uh, salary cap, whether it's uh, personnel evalu evaluation, wherever it is, um, and, it, and he believes it, he's going to use it. One, and that's also another misnomer about Coach Harbaugh. Yes, he's an old school football guy, ex-quarterback, played in the league for 13, 14 years. But you know what? Um, he's as smart as they come. He's as bright as, as bright as anybody. And so he's really into looking at how do I create advantages? How do I create mismatches? Prague, what can you show me with respect to different things on and off the field that'll help me get, get an advantage in this particular game against this particular opponent? Um, and so, and he's been, coach has been doing it for a long time. It just so happens that, uh, you know, starting 11 years ago, it, it, it was me working on different things. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question, and if mm -hmm. it's silly, uh, bl you, could, you could blow me off. We've talked about analytics and actual game time and game play. Mm -hmm. How much analytics does it go? Because under your tenure, we've, we've, we've gone through three coaches. Mm -hmm. How much analytics goes into actual coach selection? So there's a lot of analytics that go. I mean, it goes into everything. I mean, there's a lot of, I'll give a great example. I mean, one of the things, a lot of data shows 
that college coaches making the jump to the NFL, college head coaches making the jump to the NFL uh, without any prior NFL experience, um, it, there's a much higher risk factor. Um, but you know those risks are also somewhat mitigated by the fact, in our case, by the fact that uh, Coach Harbaugh played in the league for so long, and he played a position that's probably uh, one, probably is the most cerebral position in all of sports. You know, at quarterback, and so he played it at a high level. Uh, so that sort of made us feel a lot better with respect to his hire. Uh, but it absolutely plays a part. I mean, obviously, it's the same thing as with player evaluation. It's the same thing with uh, looking for coaches. Same thing in looking for just talent in the front office, whether it be in business development, sponsorship, wherever it is, um, in that you can, you can use data to help you identify maybe a pool of, of talent or pool of players and, or a pool of coaches. Um, but then at the end of the day, you have to make sure that you match uh, the personality dynamics within the office or within uh, you know, what type of personality would best manage or get the most out of our players. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we did a lot of, I could tell you in our coaching search uh, this past year, one of the biggest things with respect to uh, analytics was looking at our games. Uh, our, we were a 6-10 team last year, but we lost seven games in the last few minutes of the game by three points or less or few, three or fewer points. And so we thought we were a team that already had a lot of talent um, and was already on the rise. We just needed a, a true inspirational leader that could immediately do a turnaround. And so um, forget the like, track record of coaches. What we looked at, uh, or back bi bi bios of coaches, what we looked at was Coach Harbaugh made a successful, fast turnaround at University of San Diego. He made a successful, fast turnaround at Stanford. And there's no reason to think that as long as he had the talent um, you know, and the players, and we, we already believe that he did, that he can do the same thing at, at the 49ers, and he yeah. did. Again, a heck of a hire, you know, absolutely a heck of a hire. Let me, let me ask you another question as we wrap up here. The theme of the conference is always been analytics. The theme of our conversation has been analytics. Mm -hmm. A question I asked Scott Boris was, and I'm going to ask you the very same question, to what point did we become too reliant on analytics? Analytics can't prevent Kyle Williams from not calling a fair catch. Analytics, you know, they're not telling quarterback to not throw a certain pass. Analytics don't tell Alex... Uh, Smith to throw that pass to Vernon Davis at the end. Right. That's my question to you. How, at, at what point do we take the analytics out of it and just... You use it, yeah, you use it as a tool. It's not the end-all, be-all. You use it as a tool. It's one more piece to the puzzle, whether you're evaluating a player, whether you're structuring the salary cap, um, whatever you're doing, you use it as a piece to the puzzle. Um, and, and that's the most I can say. I mean, as, as ne negotiating contracts, for example, um, you know, we, we think about the team as a portfolio, right? Um, and so we look at how much money we want to distribute to each player um, you know, or each position group. But you know what? If you've got, maybe we only want to distribute X dollars to the linebacker position. But you know what? If we feel like we've got two, poten maybe three potential Hall of Fame linebackers, then, you know, you've got to blow that up and you've got to start, um, you've got a position defining or redefining uh, player then analytics sort of has to go out the window because then you structure the team around, uh, around that kind of redefining talent. And so there's certain cases where you've got to do that. Uh, you've, uh, analytics wouldn't have predicted Jeremy Lin would be a star, yeah. right? They wouldn't have predicted uh, a lot of players on our team uh, would be stars. You know, look at uh, Vernon Davis. He had a lot of the athletic measurements and physical characteristics um, of a successful player, but he didn't have a large body of work when, at, at college. Uh, and yet there were certain things that we determined that would make him successful. But at the, end of the day, at the end of the day, it was based on his dedication, his determination, his desire to be successful that really differentiated him once he got to the league. Not all the stats, not all his uh, speed and any of those things. If he doesn't have that same sort of maniacal drive to succeed that Coach Harbaugh does, he's not going to be successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my last question to you is, uh, so this conference is put on by MIT Sloan School of Management. Yep. A lot of kids out there, a lot of business school students out there, a lot of just students out there in general. Mm -hmm. And we continue to be blown away by that. You took a very interesting <coughs> path to where you are. You mind sharing a little bit about that to the aspiring student out sure. there? Sure. Yeah. No, I was, a, um, I was a, management consulting, a management consultant coming out of undergrad. I uh, did that for two and a half years. I was, I was put on a lot of sports type projects. Uh, and then Coach Walsh, Coach Bill Walsh, hired Bain, the company I was working for, to work on a project for the 2001 draft to evaluate uh, the draft picks. Not the players, but the actual value of the slots, like an exchange rate. Um, and so I was put on that project. It was a pro bono almost type case from Bain. I was put on that project. Coach Walsh asked me to come over full time in 2001. And I started doing a lot of just salary cap research, just looking at uh, how to structure contracts, how to do escalators, de-escalators, things like that. Um, and then there was a two-year stint there where I went to uh, Stanford full-time 
full-time business school, full-time work for two years. Um, and, you know, and, and then my role started to grow. I became our chief contract negotiator right after I finished at Stanford in 2004 and uh, just been, been growing since. And, you know, the thing is, uh, yeah, 11 years ago, there, there, I was hiding from an MBA. When I dealt with agents, um, I, I, was, I didn't talk about it. I was almost embarrassed to talk about the fact that I had an MBA uh, because I didn't know what perception that would create with the agents. And, so, and now it's totally different. I mean, there's such an influx of talent uh, from outside talent. This is no longer uh, an, an industry about who you know. It's becoming much more an industry about what you know. Uh, and it's slowly becoming more of a meritocracy, like traditional businesses. You've been walking the halls today. What are your thoughts of the conference? Oh, it's great. I mean, I've been here three out of the last four years, and it's really grown. Uh, and, and one thing that I noticed is that a few years ago it was mostly just undergrad students or grad students, and now it's you know probably uh, maybe two thirds of the attendees here are uh, folks in working already in the business world or work already in the sports world that are just looking to come here and kind of enhance or augment the skills they already have. Uh, it's kind of neat. It's it's grown to be quite large. Yeah. What do Joe Montana, Jerry Rice, and Parag Murat have in common? All handpicked by Coach Wall. <laughs> That's pretty incredible. <laughs> Thanks, Parag. Appreciate it, Ricky. All right.